Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. This program brought to you in part by Selco. Hello and welcome to Reading for Life. My name is Julie Kleinfelter, Library Director in Austin, Minnesota, and I have three very special guests with me today. Our Reading for Life presenter is Michael Verde. Michael graduated with honors from the University of Texas's Plan II Honors Program, earned a master's degree in literary studies from the University of Iowa, and an MA in theology from the University of Durham, England. He's taught for 15 years at the university and college prep school levels, most recently at Indiana University, and is currently completing his PhD with a focus on literature and religion. Michael founded Reading for Life in 2005. We're also joined today by Steve Harson, Public Library Consultant for Southeastern Libraries Cooperating, and Jen Lawhead, Director of Community Education in Austin. So welcome everyone. Michael, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. First, let me say that um, Let's think about a way to get into the book without doing a plot summary that will nevertheless introduce some of the main characters and themes that we can then work through together in whatever way our imagination leads us. So one way to think about the way that meaning is made, and there's two principal ways that meaning is generated. Number one is through opposites. If you think about it for a second, it's kind of opposite, but it's kind of obvious. We know what tall is only because we know what short is and vice versa. And with regards to this particular novel, the opposites of life and death are interestingly um, contrasted in a conspicuous way, including the first two paragraphs. And we can circle back to that in a second. But in any case, opposites are a way that we we make meaning out of things and orient ourselves to whatever complexity we might be um, observing or participating in. The second way that meaning is made is through, you could say, a fusion of two things becoming one, including things that were opposite. Maybe a quintessential example of both of those could be Romeo and Juliet, with the Montagues and the Capulets as a kind of opposites, and even with the color schema of, of the play of red and blue, for instance, or contrast th these uh, primary colors. But then you can also think about what is love, that's Romeo and Juliet coming together. So what were really uh, up and coming young people are, are the seeds of these two antagonistic camps within uh, Verona. It is Verona, right? In any case, these two antagonistic camps come together to become this one. And interestingly, in that moment of becoming one, there is also life and death. I mean, one of the, the things about it is Romeo going to stay when the sun is coming up. He's at, it's a, a, outside of Juliet's window there. The sun is coming up and she's warning him that when the sun comes up, your life is going to be in danger. And he has to decide, do I stay or do I go? And if he stays, he gets his love, but he loses his life. If he goes, he gets his life, but he loses his love. So it's a wonderful kind of play on opposites. In any case, that's a way we can work our, I think our imaginations into this novel is let's take, first of all, opposites that come to mind and see what sort of scenes or characters present themselves in that schema. And then we can consider two or more things becoming one thing. And then after we do that, we'll just sort of see what, what uh, we can develop from ideas that have come up, however spontaneously. So somebody get us started with opposites. The wildness of the marsh versus the civilization on the land. Bravo. Let's let's keep an eye on that because it's huge, right, for structure and everything in the novel. And secondly, just to kind of uh, develop that idea a little bit with regards to language, uh, the, the narrator makes a similar contrast between the language of the court and the language of nature. 
related both of, in other words, both of those worlds, the world of civilization and the world of wildness, are also metaphorically identified with uses of language. There is a kind of wild use of language, and then there is a civilized use of language. So great, somebody else. I was thinking a lot about the kindness of jumping as contrasted or opposite of the treatment of the folks in town. Okay, wonderful. That's a, that's a great example. And, then, and that's interesting to think about jumping and Maybell. What world are they coming from? Because it, it, geographically, they're situated in, you could say, in the civilized world, but I think we can recognize they're marginalized. There's a, a because of their, their race, they're not really integrated and accepted into the, to the world in which they're geographically set. So they're, that's kind of interesting how they're, I don't know if there's necessarily in between, but there's certainly clearly more affinities between Kaya and Jumpin' in Mayville than there is between uh, the city folks and Jumpin' in Mayville. So that's, a, that's an interesting oh, contrast. And I think that they are definitely in between. They are on the margin of the marsh. They are the connection between civilization and the marsh. That dock represents a lot in that regard. Um, and so I see them very much as being in that middle ground or being the the arbiter between the marsh and the and civilization. Great. And even dock, metaphorically speaking, that's a great way to think of it, right? A dock is in between mm -hmm. the water and the land. Wonderful. Great. Julie, what about a contrast? I think the the two characters of Tate Andrew or Tate Walker and Chase Andrews, but that's similar to that wild marsh versus civilization. So you have Tate Walker who kind of represents that the more what the more natural or nature ver you know character, and then you have Chase Andrews who's more of the civilized in theory um, character. Great. Let's uh, I mentioned life and death is an important contrast in the first two paragraphs. The, and I just want to talk about it just because of the, the consequence to the overall novel. You can think of openings and endings for a writer as particularly uh, they're supercharged with consequence. Let's put it that way. You're, you're introducing what is very likely going to be a theme that's realized in a greater degree of complexity and developed. And then you're also kind of bringing things to a kind of a, a, a closure, often an epiphany of a sort. So in this particular novel, the first two paragraphs makes a distinction between the marsh and the swamp, which uh, is, is kind of interesting because we think of the marsh and the swamp as sort of being uh, synonyms or synonymous with one another. But in fact, she makes a distinction in the very first sentence, the marsh is not swamp. Now your very first sentence, that's really a big deal. So what's important about the swamp not being a marsh and she distinguishes in the, the, the marshes where essentially things are alive and uh, generative, but the swamp is where all things go to decompose, that there is nothing about the swamp that is, has this kind of generativity. And yet her last, in part of the last sentence of the second paragraph, she says, life decays, speaking about it, the swamp, Life decays and reeks and returns to the rotted duff. Then the last part here, a poignant wallow of death begetting life or begetting life. So she does make a kind of turnaround here where that lot death in this instance in the swamp, although it is a place of absolute decomposition, is also the place from whence all life comes. How about this notion of death begetting life? Because I think in some ways it's counterintuitive, and yet it seems to be thematically a, a kind of nuclear or the nucleus of this novel that there's something about death that is absolutely vital. So somebody take us from there. Well, on that first paragraph, I really strongly felt, even as I was exposed to it the first time, that that paragraph was also setting up the metaphor that that the marsh represents Kaya or Kaya represents the marsh. And in that sense, it sort of sets you up for the things that happen later in the book that Kaya is not death, Kaya is not destruction, Kaya is not decay. And part of the surprise at the end is that you were set up for that at the very beginning. Okay, that's, that's a wonderful thinking of metaphors to think of Kaya aspects of Kaya 
being metaphorically identified to these two locales. Partakaya being metaphorically identified with the marsh, Partakaya being metaphorically identified with the swamp. Excellent. Mm -hmm. other, other cool thoughts. Well, I think it's interesting that looking at that sentence, the a poignant wallow of death begetting life from that second paragraph, and then looking at the very last sentence of the book, which is way out yonder where the crawdad sings. I know we've talked a little bit about the title and how does the title fit in? People always ask that. And it, it's an interesting um, that, you know, where the crawdad sings is maybe where death begets life that that's that that's where that happens um kind of metaphorically for this novel and i think that that is true the death of the one character makes it possible for the other character to have a life the life okay. that she wants that's an interesting idea that in, in one sense kaya is a source of death but she is a source of death that in effect kills death mm -hmm. There's something about Kali, the, the Hindu uh, goddess that's, I think, related to, this is the blue uh, goddess that seems yeah. so fierce. And you often see in Hindu mythology uh, things that look demonic, and yet their role is often to kill the ego. That's mm -hmm. what all, some of these Hindu uh, gods that look so fierce, they are fierce because the ego itself it requires that kind of ferocity. So um, in one way to think about what Kaya does, although she's a source of death, uh, that the target or the recipient of her action is itself a source of death. So that's interesting uh, to think about. And if there's some kind of moral justification for the ultimate vision, I think it would be related to the notion that the only thing that Kaya kills is something that is a source of death. Also, for those of us in the Midwest, it may not be an obvious um, comparison, but isn't it true that crawdads, shrimp, lobster, those crustaceans, they live by feeding on decaying flesh, decaying things, and that then in that sense, they clean the environment. And so is there a part of that that plays into this story that if we lived in, say, the bayou, we might relate to really closely, but coming from where we come from, we need to, to have that called to our attention. Wonderful. I did not know that about crustaceans, uh, Steve, so that's wonderful. Uh, I, I'll, I'll take it to be the case, and so that, that would be a wonderful tie-in. But uh, Julie, maybe it was relate to what you just said, too. Julie, I think one of the things you were pointing our attention to is what is out there beyond? I mean, where the crawdad scenes are beyond. So what is it that is beyond? And maybe we can sort of link it to what we're talking about. What is it that is beyond? Which is kind of a, it's an interesting thing to think about something that is beyond, in some ways, articulation or definition. I mean, it's on the other side, let's say, of the civilized world, the other side of the world in which there's order. And yet at the same time, the beyond seems to be absolutely vital to the order in some way. In other words, even though it is beyond, it's playing a role that the order depends upon to maintain its order. So I think that is kind of what we're getting at a little bit here. What is this beyond and why is it we can't afford to say no going to the beyond. We, we don't want it at all. Apparently we need the beyond is what I'm, I'm trying to get at. And I'm wondering why that is the case that we need the beyond. Well, I think in this uh, particular novel, she was so safe and so um, comfortable in her marsh, but kind of the source of her financial freedom at least was going into the what she would consider the beyond when she went to the town and she worked on her um, books. So moving to that beyond was a source of, of some kind of freedom for her, even though she um, felt much more comfortable in her safe space. And that's a great notion that beyond is relative, right? To where is home. I love what you did with that, Jennifer. The beyond for Kaya, in some sense, would have been a town. So that, that's kind of relative, that, that is cool. And in this case, there was some kind of sustenance that was absolutely vital, that she couldn't get. In other words, there was something about her life in the marsh that was absolutely self-sustaining except for this piece. And now that you mentioned that, I had the same notion with regards to her heart. 
because in one sense, I, it didn't seem that Kaya needed people especially much, except with regards to her longing for a kind of affection that she simply could not get from the birds or the crawdads. In other words, I thought this was really interesting to think of that the human heart, as much as we can be at home in the beyond, that there is something in our longing that draws us back to people, those um, unfair, duplicitous people that are also predators, that nevertheless, our heart can't live without. So I thought that was an interesting kind of thing, that she did need people. Well, and there's the beyond that is kind of what, you know, the the civilization, but there's also, she talks about the beyond being where the crawdads sing. So there's also the where you've come from and not just you, but your past where you're, I think it's in the conversation that she has with Jody um, and he's trying to explain why Ma left and she somebody says, you know, in nature out yonder where the crawdads sing, some parts of us will always be what we were, what we had to be to survive way back yonder. Um, so I think that beyond is, there's almost two different ways you can look at it is the beyond that you move towards and the beyond that you're coming from. And, and I think again, that where the crawdad sings, it's kind of up to interpretation as to which, and maybe it varies in the book. Sometimes it, where the crawdad sings is where you've come from. And sometimes where the crawdad sings is maybe where you're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea that that can be understood temporally. In other words, this could be a matter of time or space. And that's great. I never thought about that, but that is wonderful. And, and, you know, I think Julie, as, as you said, that is beyond extends in both directions. Yeah. So for instance, there's also the beyond of her publisher, her publishing house that's in New York. When she meets with her publisher, she meets with them in some middle ground with the person who's working on her book, but doesn't really go to New York. And in a sense that, that, that world is in a beyond state as well as the marsh is. Very cool. And that, that's obviously when you said that, Steve, I thought about, first of all, her success as a published naturalist, which mm -hmm. is to say that she's celebrated within the civilized world at a very, I would say, very erudite level, in fact. And yet what distinguishes her work as this naturalist is something that is related to her seclusion or isolation in other words it's because she's so closely affiliated with the march and swamp you could almost say she's, she's she's the incarnation of this place it's because of that intimacy that she's able to glean the kinds of insights with re re regards to details that the folks in the erudite academic world are oblivious to uh, so that that's an interesting way of thinking about opposites, but also the way that they absolutely sort of require uh, the contributions of one another. Very interesting. I hadn't thought before about how she wouldn't have been able to be so um, successful with her um, paint, paintings if she hadn't been so intimately connected. I didn't, I mean, I probably should have thought about that, but I didn't think about how someone coming in from the outside wouldn't notice all the intricacies as someone who lived with it day to day. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And that's a huge verb or concept in the novel, isn't it? Noticing uh, the details. This is a, a constant theme that she's discerning specificity. And one of the ways that we know that, that Chase's future as a, as, a, as a male character is probably not bright is with the way that he understands the marsh is something you use. And that that relationship to that place makes him blind to the details. So he knows it as a general thing. And if we imagine this with regards to intimacy, uh, you could imagine knowing the other person is something you use, in which case they're a general thing. That's a woman in general, let's say, from a man's uh, perspective. If you're thinking about, you know, as a teenage boy, something you're going to satisfy yourself with, but you don't need to know them intimately. Uh, 
And in fact, there were several places in the book where that was expressly put into words. Okay. Does one come to mind, Steve? Or just in I can't think of one just offhand, but he dismissed as like just a woman or you know, you know, all women. There are things that he says that 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 convey that. Yeah. I don't remember a specific yeah. quote. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe that's one way we can think about the difference between uh Tate and Chase is that Tate is conversant with the detail. I mean, isn't one of that, this one of the sources of their intimacy is they speak a common language and, and the, the language in the alphabet is this natural world that they share. Well, and well even Kaya wasn't always the expert because the first she had, Tate had to show her how to come home. Right, so there is that that balance that she didn't know everything about her environment, even though she was deeply immersed in it. Oh, wonderful! And Tate brings poetry to her too, which is you know he he talks about he introduces her to poetry and he says, you know, poetry poems make you feel something, and if you follow the poems, and I've been wanting to, I've been meaning to go back through and just read the poems when they show up in the book all the way through because I have a feeling that that would also lead you to um, kind of a, it's kind of a heads up of what's coming. Um, when we were talking about noticing, what I remember thinking was if you paid really close attention to Kaya's description of the insects that she was observing, you also see something coming. You know, she talks about the fireflies luring, the female fireflies lure, luring the males in. And she taught, I think there's a scene too, isn't there with a praying mantis that she's watching the praying mantises um, and that they mate and then the female kills the male and she watches that it's just and it but it's like this subtle side you don't realize it's part of what's coming um, until you look at it again afterwards and notice that those I are think you're I think you're really right about that Julie and that all of these uh, things that you're referencing are devices that increase the complexity and the richness of this book that I think right raises it to, you know, literary status as opposed to just being a romance novel. It's those layers. Yeah, it's those many, many, and there's there's a lot of layers in this work. It must have been an immense undertaking to put it together. Uh, Jennifer, what you said about uh, Tate's introduction or being a, a crucial catalyst for Kaya's maturity in lots of ways. The fact that he is the source of her literacy. And also that made me think about, we're going back to this beyond stuff, that you would, in order to write poetry, that in some way would be, uh, that would do justice to the indescribable. In other words, if you're gonna do justice to the beyond, you almost, have to use language that would make the beyond imaginable. So we need language to communicate things that almost defy articulation. But in any case, what I'm getting around is, is the role that poetry plays with regards to what we would think of as normal uses of language or civilized use of language. So how is poetry where the crawdads sing, for instance? And how, and, and how is it that we can uh, um, use language to defy normal uses of language, <clears throat> knowing that we need these things that are not normal uses of language? In other words, there's something we get from poetry that we can't get from normal uses of language. And yet, if you did not learn the alphabet, and you could even think of a poet as someone that knows language at the kind of specificity that we're saying analogously relates to Kaya and the Marsh. I mean, a poet knows words at that degree of detail and consequently can use language in unanticipated ways, perhaps in some instances, unprecedented ways. I'm just trying to play around with the irony that we would need a common alphabet and understanding of grammar that synchronized our, our intellects in order to go beyond normal uses of language. Well, and doesn't Tate say something to Kaya at the very beginning when the first time she reads a word 
I think it's cab. And she's like, well, I don't know what a cab is. And he says, don't worry. He's like, you'll never not, you'll never not be a reader again. And it's that idea that this, he's opened this world up for her um, with that, with, you know, what seemed like a very simple thing at the beginning that is going to bring all of this to her life. Um, And the other thing I wanted to point out really quick before I forget too, is I thought it was interesting that Tate does he so he brings her language and he brings her the ability he brings her poetry but you do find out too about midway through the book when Jody shows up back to Kaya's house and brings the paintings that he had received and one of the paintings is of Kaya and Tate from when they're little and so Tate's been a part of her life you find out you know from the very beginning and so they had that that she doesn't Kaya doesn't even remember Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that was interesting too and also that despite him being the one who brings her words, he's the one who destroys her words. Mm-hmm. And the only way that her words then would be preserved, if presumably that they were published in the local paper. And so they might hang around in print form somewhere that way. Mm-hmm. So you mean uh, Tate destroys her words at the end of the? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. This is great. You know, you just pick a little, a little trope of opposites, and look what happens when you, you start talking about the this novel and the way it connections that I would have not have thought of when we sat down fifteen minutes ago. <laughs> really wonderful. Along the lines of the language piece, I've been thinking um, lately about some folks that I've had engagement with who, in their first language, didn't have words for colors. And so understanding the concept of color was beyond them because they didn't have the language to name it. And so I think there's something, some connection here too with providing language to name things in in Kaya's life. Well, and she does that, right? Once Tate teaches her how to read, she goes back to all of those feathers she's got on her wall and she names everything and she uses, you know, she writes the names and labels everything. So I think they, it's, it's an interesting, they kind of describe that there too. That I think is really the implication that are profound because it suggests for people that we do not have immediate access to the beyond or rather that there is aspects of the world that without language, we're not going to know, which I think kind of defies what would be intuitive that we could just sort of, you know, when you find that every once in a while they do have these feral children that are found in nature <clears throat> and they're always absolutely tragic because there's again and again, something about the development that they didn't have at a certain point that seemingly forever puts them in some ways on a different universe. In other words, there's something about feral children in which they don't become human in the way we imagine our own humanity. Mm -hmm. So the the irony I'm suggesting is to become fully our, even our wild self requires, in this instance, language. It requires something we share to even become something that is beyond. And you might even extend that a little further to include our understanding of the beyond, that we might have the knowledge, but we don't have the words. And until we have those words, we might not know that we have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I wonder, I think that's a great hypothesis. Is it because we don't have the words and we don't know them? Or is it because without the words, they don't exist for us to know? Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, that might seem like it's a theoretical or blah, blah, blah kind of thing. But in fact, the entire, at least with regards to the Judeo-Christian tradition, absolutely hinges on what we're talking about here. Because the, in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, God is not in nature. And this is absolutely vital that God is a, is a God speaks. In other words, God is outside of nature and creates nature. And one of the ways the Jewish people were distinguishing themselves from these pagan empires is that their gods were in nature. But the Jewish God was not in nature, but he was in language. Well, let's go right back to the very beginning. I am the word. The word is God. Yeah, there you go. So this is, I guess, what I'm trying to just play around with myself is how language relates to the beyond. <laughs> 
because I think initially I would have thought of those as opposites. But now as we're talking, I'm not so confident that the opposite of the beyond is, is language. In regards to this novel, how that relates specifically to why Tate is a necessary and satisfying love or, or other half and why Chase isn't. In other words, there's a degree of intimacy that has something to do with them being able to communicate with a language that's beyond. Whereas with Chase, even though there's, the, I think it's very clear that sexually she does feel that there is something between her and Chase that is primal. And yet it does well, not include this communicative element is what I'm getting at. Chase's use of language is manipulative. Okay, that's a wonderful way to put it. So let's think about that. That's a, I'm glad you said that. How is it that when we use language with poetry, I'm distinguishing poetry between normal use of language and based on the great distinction you just made, how is it that when we create poetry that is actually pop, and we would say that's a poem as opposed to, well, let me try again tomorrow. When it pops, how, I'm, I'm taking your idea, Steve, that maybe it's when we don't use language to achieve an instrumental end. In other words, we're not manipulating language to get something that enables language to manifest itself in a way that is absolutely consummating to our imagination and satisfying. In other words, when we don't try to use language to get something, that language reveals itself to us. And I'm just making an analogy between that and Tate and Chase. Well, and doesn't that come back to the ego too? If if your ego is in control, then you're always using language to manipulate. But if you can get your your ego out of the way, then your your language can be used to do other, you know, other things, create, um, engage, you know, in other ways, not manipulative. I love that. And if we're thinking about reading for life, having something to do with community, just, I'm just developing what you've suggested, uh, 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 Julie, that maybe there's communities that are essentially people in agreeing to use each other. Okay. It's not necessarily that we want to prey on each other, but I need something from you. You need something from me. It's transactional. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's communities like that, but then maybe there are communities where that's not the ultimate logic where it's not transactional in fact that there's a degree to which we are feeding each other instead of feeding on each other i would think only the latter where you're feeding each other would be a real community and that the other would be we need a different word for it maybe it's a society or, or but in any case the idea is could we could we is there a sense in which in order for us to be a community a genuine community instead of people manipulate each other that we need to be able to access language and communicate with each other in a way that really lends itself to that kind of community. And if that's the case, then I'm suggesting that literature maybe offers us that, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. That we can meet I'm, it. Go ahead, Steve. I'm not gonna suggest that we go too far down this rabbit hole, but I wonder if it could be a topic of an entire discussion to look mm -hmm. at the ways in which uh, language is manipulated or language is used to manipulate people and what are the purposes and the methods that are used in the book to do both okay so we think of rhetoric is a way to manipulate people but poetry though it might have rhetorical devices may not be the same thing as rhetoric mm -hmm. well the reason why i think there's something practical here is that you can think about many uses of language in which a community is the last thing that's going to happen. I mean, when I turn on the news and I see that they put one side over here and one side over here and the whole drama involves both sides uh, taking truth and doing weird things with it, I think I don't know what the chances are of community if we talk like this. So is it possible that we could find a space uh, if communicating in which that really wasn't the structure of the engagement? And I'm suggesting maybe literature offers us that possibility. That we, like we're doing right now, we don't have to be on four different teams. Uh, we're all learning from each other. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that maybe this is a role that literature plays. It gives us a beyond in which assumptions can be decomposed. Mm 
you know, absolute beliefs. Normatively, for instance, once upon a time, African-American people went to the back of the bus. That was normal. That was civilized. Uh, that needed to be decomposed for us to become more human. And I'm suggesting maybe literature offers us a space where we can take our beliefs that we're taking for granted and actually uh, decompose some of them, if you see what I mean, so that we get to something more generative. Maybe literature enables us, in other words, to step back from our normal uses of language to break out of these certain adhesions to beliefs to see which ones do we need to decompose because we may be harboring beliefs that are really need to go to the swamp. I was listening to a podcast this morning that talked about um, in some spiritual places or some places of worship uh, manipulation is used. So when you talked about manipulation of language, I think there's also manipulation of the other senses of of smell and sound and and light so it doesn't really have to do with the book but it kind of prompted my thinking that I really hadn't thought about um, mani manipulation in the ways that we're talking about today and, and with that podcast so that's really something that's going to be swirling in my mind for a bit mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible to move people without manipulating people? I guess that's another way of thinking about poetry. Can we move people without manipulating people? And if we can, I don't know what community is. And if we can, I'd like to know where we learn this capacity. Well, I think the difference you talked about was if it's generative or not, right? And so I think if it's generative, then I think then it's not done with manipulation. So that's kind of the connection I'm making. Well, I think that's a really a, a, a great one. It's got a built-in sort of criteria in our acid test. Well, and it explains, I think, a lot of what we're seeing in the world today is exactly what you said, Michael, is a lot of times with the media, um, there is more manipulation than not. And we have lost maybe some of our spaces where we were having those more generative conversations, um, you know, whether it was newspaper, newsprint. And I mean, if you think back to, I've been watching a lot of like Bridgerton and those kinds of things. Do so you think back a couple hundred years ago where their, their, um, their media was written and it was, and there was space in between and there was um, and now with our social media, I know I have kids, so it's one of the things I think about a lot is their communications come in smaller sound bites and there's less time to, to process or think through or interact. You know, we've lost a little bit of that. And I think that's one of the things that I've enjoyed about this reading for life program is it, it's that the time in between, between the podcast and the lecture and the next podcast, it's the rereading, it's the talking through of those pieces with other people and doing exactly what we're doing here, where you have four different ideas. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I loved English and history as a student, because there were no, not history so much, but English, there were not no necessarily wrong answers as long as you could follow through with the thought whereas in the calculus class I was in it was black and white right or wrong and I was not very good at that <laughs> so it was one of those things that I that I appreciated and um, I do think that's part of what at least Michael and I when we first started talking about doing a program like this was that idea of can you get people together to talk about those things and have those generative moments um, without the manipulation, like what does that look like and how does that function in society? You know, I, Julie, I think you're right. And I think about the books that we've talked about in the past and how much time we spend talking about words and the power of the word and how much care goes into crafting a book using the words and what those words mean. And, and that's true. And, and then bringing that back to this book and the concept of manipulation that we were talking about, I think we have some stark examples in this particular book of manipulating words to convey meaning in the form of poetry and then manipulating a person by using the words that you know will motivate them to do what you're looking for and that might be part of what we're seeing going on in our world around us today so maybe this book has a message 
relating to that too. Nice. I think about when two people come together in a genuine, intimate way that they reach a point where they're, they're not manipulating each other, I would think, uh, ideally. And I'm wondering if that's possible too with language. In other words, I want to make a distinction between rhetoric and poetry at some point. I, I want to say that rhetoric can take us so far, mm -hmm. but that maybe there's a relationship to language in which language gets an equal word in edgewise. In other words, it's not just our imagination that's making this, let's say, novel. It's our imagination in intimacy with language and that the language is contributing to the final produce of the novel. This is, I think, absolutely crucial. And we talk about the things they carry. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there's a very conspicuous theme uh, that on the other side of ego, you might say, language starts to speak through us. We need each other, but there's a sense in which the, the novel's not coming entirely. You could say it's coming out of my imagination, but my imagination is partly has allegiance to the language and not to my ego. I just, I just want to throw that out there that actually maybe what makes art is when, in this case, verbal art, when language starts to get an equal word in edgewise, the way you would think a couple would be two people allowing genuine dialogue to come through them. I'm suggesting that with language, we can have a relationship with language that's like that. And in the context of both the book and this conversation, our imagination is being guided by the manipulation of the words that the author put into this book. Well, I think that's true, but I want to throw out the possibility that the manipulation may only get us so far. In other words, mm -hmm. I want to suggest that maybe at a certain point, nobody's manipulate anybody because something closer to two people becoming one mm -hmm. is taking place with language. Now, I will, I mean, that might be rare, okay? I certainly think what you've described is the norm that we manipulate language to get things. But maybe there's a relationship with language where all of a sudden you hear something that's not coming from your own impetus. I'll put it that way. It starts to speak. I think I think the the author Delia Owens. I think kind of the back of my book has some information from her, and I think she gets to that a little bit where she says that that one of the primary uses of or one of the primary a novelist is is being a storyteller, but they have to be careful that their message isn't getting in the way of the story they're telling. And I think that's her way of acknowledging that, that there is that her the story she wants to tell, she realizes that as the storyteller, there are there is another story that's going to be told, and she doesn't want her intentions to get in, in the way of the story that's trying to be told through her telling the story. I think I thought that was really interesting when when I read that, that that she's acknowledging that as well, that there are multiple levels to storytelling. And I think what you're maybe getting at, Michael, is that one like that, that kind of what when we get kind of that jolt out of having these conversations and is when we're able to see that that thread of what's coming through maybe in spite of the author, in spite of us of, as readers, and when we can put ourselves aside and really just hear what's coming through the writing. You know, Julie, Julie, I think that's really a smart observation. And you've hosted many authors in your library. In my career, I've hosted zillions of authors in my, in my libraries. And I think how often I have heard the authors say that they don't go into the story knowing what the story is going to be, that they have to start writing it so the characters can tell them what the story is. And I think that relates right back to what you're you're saying Delia Owens wrote in the in the in the book. Well, and I think we heard that from Tim O'Brien as well. Yes, yes, absolutely we did. Don't you think that must be the buzz if you're a writer? Oh, sure. All yeah. of a sudden. Mm -hmm. They say if you ever hit a perfect golf swing, you'll never quit playing golf. I don't know. I've never hit a perfect golf swing. But I would think that an analog to that in writing is mm 
if you're ever writing one day and all of a sudden you start to experience the presence of something speaking through you, it's probably a very addictive feeling. Mm -hmm. And, and honestly, among practicing authors today that I've interacted with, most of them, in my, my uh, estimation, would tell you that that's how they write and why they write, because they have to find out what the characters are telling them. Um, there are the few who, who do very much the opposite, and we have some prominent ones right here in this area, who begin with a story and an outline, and, and, the, and then they fill in. But today, the the common practice seems to be to let the characters tell the author what their story is. You remember the epigraph or a little preamble to the Song of Solomon is mm -hmm. Tony Morrison saying, you know, I used to hear people talk about the muse and I thought that was just a way that writers kind of strategically deflected questions they didn't want to answer. But as of because of this book, I'm absolutely convinced that that's the case. And she gives the example that she wrote a sentence, not thinking too much about it as an opener. And it turned out within the sentence, the entire novel was germinating and she didn't realize it until. So I, I suspect that um, whatever we mean by art has something to do with what we're talking about now. It's something that gets a word in edgewise that we're not manipulating. Mm -hmm. And maybe that, and maybe that words are ultimately the key to human consciousness. I would. That's my. That's my thought. I mean, I wouldn't know what human consciousness is if it isn't a kind of conversation with yourself or with the other. I mean, I don't know what we mean by consciousness if it didn't involve some kind of dialogue with something. Well, and we think about with um, the brain development and young children and the most important thing that can be done to build that brain and build the synapses is to talk, read and sing with them. The language is the key to the, the brain development. It isn't, it isn't black and white flashcards and it's that talking, the reading, the singing, the language and the connections with people through that language. And so I think that that connects a lot to the theme we've been talking about today. And what if we think of consciousness, the brain, the human intellect as the beyond, mm -hmm. and that we have to find a way to understand that, and our tool is words? That's wonderful. Okay, that then playing off what Steve said, what if language is like the dock uh, to the beyond? That's mm -hmm. a wonderful way to, that would be a, a very interesting way to think of language as opposed to a tool. Mm -hmm. I mean, I Part of my PhD work has to do with making a distinction between language as a tool and language as a medium. And a medium even sounds like doc, uh, of something that is allowing conversation in both directions. Mm -hmm. Very different than a hammer. Mm -hmm. right. Well, speaking of our, just without getting into too much of, of current affairs, I think we do recognize that we're in a very polarized moment. And I do wonder if it would be possible for people to come together who might have beliefs that are very antagonistic at one level. But I wonder if it would be possible to put those beliefs, let's say, just in a, in a brackets for a bit, and to engage with works of literature and to see if maybe some kind of conversation could take shape that didn't involve pitting one binary against the other. We started out saying meaning is made in two ways, through opposites and through mergers. And I wonder if it might be possible for people who uh, are stewards of very uh, contrary beliefs to find mergers through a medium that wasn't designed to sell commercials. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't this what most of our TV is about, is to sell a commercial? So we have to think that behind the collisions that are generated is the idea to keep you watching long enough to sell you shampoo or a car. Uh, maybe works of literature aren't trying to sell a shampoo or a car. And so therefore, uh, it doesn't have to play those kinds of games and I'm just wondering it is a make-believe scenario where people from very different ideological camps could take a work of poetry or a novel and maybe the first two hours they would be a, an opportunity to punch each other 
subtly or not subtly, but maybe after hour two, something else might happen. And I wonder if through that kind of intercourse, those people might discover that there's aspects about themselves that really there's far more in common than what uh, the news would have us to believe. I like to think that's possible. Well, I think, I mean, looking at the four of us, I think that's why we're in the fields that we're in, right? I mean, that's the goal, like between education and librarianship, it's how do you, how do you create those moments to get people in a room who don't agree to have a conversation and make a connection and find those points. Um, You know, and I think that's what keeps sometimes me motivated to do what I do is having those moments where you see it work and then trying to figure out how to spread that and how to make sure that that's happening in other places and that people are aware of, did you know that it's possible to have a really meaningful conversation with someone that you don't agree with um, and that you can find points in common and that, that that changes then you and that changes your relationship and that changes the world. And that is how one person can make a positive difference, um, whether it's through educating a child or, you know, teaching a college course to young people who are getting ready to launch out into the world or, you know, having an interaction at a library with a homeless person, or, you know, I I think that kind of in a nutshell describes my motivation throughout my career. Absolutely. Agreed. I don't know what education would be if there wasn't something that was beyond manipulation, because I would feel like I was just teaching these young people how to be more rhetorically adroit at manipulating each other if there wasn't something beyond that uh and isn't every discipline really a certain methodology and set of practices that wean the ego from getting the last word in i mean this isn't when you learn how to be an anthropologist you're learning things that would make your findings replicable and not about your opinion Mm -hmm. Uh, all of a sudden it strikes me that maybe what is beyond belief I'm thinking now where the crawdad's seeing, and I'm thinking now that the beyond is beyond beliefs. Okay, this is beyond beliefs. That if there's not a place beyond beliefs, we're never going to be the United States of America, because I don't know that we're united through our beliefs. It might be that our beliefs, in fact, divide us, but there might be something beyond our beliefs that unite us. And I think that's an interesting way to think of po- about poetry, because in a sense, you don't believe or not believe in poetry. You, you don't, a metaphor is not believable. And yet apparently we, we need it uh, to, to, to satisfy something in us the way that Kaya needs Tate to satisfy something in her and vice versa. Okay. What is this beyond belief that we need in order to be united? I think is a very interesting way to think about art. Well, guys, you always fire me up. You know, whenever we sit down to talk, I kind of have a thought or two, but not too many. And then every time it dawns on me about six or seven minutes in the conversation, oh my God, we're not going to have time (laughs) to explore all the things that we put on the table. So thank you so much for one, just getting into the novel. It's so much more fun to read knowing that you have a, a group of, kind, smart, uh, just people that love life to talk about the novel with in a non-competitive way. So that adds to my reading life. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. And I really, I thought this has been such an interesting of the, this is the seventh novel that we've done. And this is the one that I was the most worried about because I really, I had not read it before and I did not know if we were going to be able to pull out enough from it. And I've, I think, I know Steve and I have talked about this, that I've, I've really turned around with this book and this is, Mm -hmm. I think a really great work of literature. And I was surprised by that, to be honest. Yeah. I also was surprised because, you know, commonly in the library, when things become like a popular sensation, they're usually not really (laughs) something of substance. But this particular book, and I I avoided reading this book Mm -hmm. because of that, but when it became the assignment for this project, 
I read it and I'm so happy because I honestly believe that this is going to have enduring value and it's going to be held on to as a work of great literature in our in our culture. Yes. So with this lecture, we have we did a podcast that is available on the library website at aplmn.org, and we will be doing another one here coming up soon. And then our next book is The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin. And this one also is a little different. This is has more of a science fiction um, thread, but is very much, I think, going to be an interesting conversation. It has a lot to do with gender. Um, which is also very much, you know, in the news right now and and a popular thing. And it's a difficult book if you haven't read it before, if you pick it up and if you get really stuck and you want to throw the book across the room, don't call me and or do call me, don't throw the book, call me and we'll we'll chat a little bit more about it. But I'm really looking forward to that next discussion as well. Because it is a hard book to read, everybody should know that it's available through the library system in downloadable audio, and there won't be a waiting list because we got the model with the 100 simultaneous users. Perfect. So uh, yeah. up to 100 people could read that book at once. Great. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you again soon. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.